Oxytocin is intertwined with sociality. Sociality is the tendency of the members of a species to live in social groups and form cooperative societies, and oxytocin plays a huge role in human sociality. But oxytocin originally evolved as, and it's still used, as a hormone that stimulates contractions of the uterus during childbirth, as well as the reflexes that allow breast milk to flow so that infants can breastfeed. Fast forward and oxytocin evolved a new but related role that is, promoting bonding between parents and offspring. Not by acting as a hormone in the body, but as a neuromodulator in the brain. Thus, oxytocin levels correlate with how well parents care for their children. Eventually, oxytocin evolved to support altruistic behavior, not only between parents and children, but among unrelated individuals as well, giving it the name, the love hormone. But as we'll see, oxytocin also has a dark side. By the way, I'm planning to make more content about social neuroscience in the future, so I want to ask you, what do you want to learn about the social brain? Drop a comment below letting me know what you think is interesting about human social behavior or what you might want to learn about how the brain accomplishes it. Also, I'm Andrew and this is Sense of Mind. If you like neuroscience and psychology, make sure to subscribe and also consider signing up for the newsletter by going to senseofmindshow.com newsletter. But first, before we get to oxytocin's effect on the social brain, I want to mention some of the experiences and stimuli that release oxytocin in the brain. How to increase oxytocin. Now importantly, most triggers of oxytocin release are social experiences. Oxytocin is released in mothers during childbirth, and it's important for forming bonds between parents and infants. A 2020 study by Brockington and colleagues found that hospitalized children who were told amusing stories and lighthearted stories had increased oxytocin levels. Oxytocin levels also go up during pleasant massage or light stroking of the skin. A 2018 study by Lee and colleagues found that a foot massage increased oxytocin levels, and this increase was significantly greater when the massage was performed by another person as opposed to a machine. Furthermore, sexual arousal and orgasm seem to increase oxytocin as well. Additionally, oxytocin can be released following not only human-human interactions, but also human-dog interactions. A 2019 review by Powell and colleagues found that positive human interactions with familiar dogs were associated with increased oxytocin, especially interactions involving mutual eye gaze. In other words, looking into your pup's eyes while you pet or play with them may increase your oxytocin levels. And some studies have even found that your dog's oxytocin levels go up too. Oxytocin is not only released during positive social interactions, because studies have shown that social stress, public speaking for example, can increase oxytocin. But this result may be more common in women with anxiety. Non-social stressors like pain and physical exercise may also increase oxytocin concentrations, but the relationship between stress and oxytocin is murky. It depends heavily on the type of stress, context, gender, and individual factors. Okay, now that we know when oxytocin is released, let's look at the effect it has on social behavior when researchers purposefully increase oxytocin levels in subjects. Let's start with how oxytocin promotes pro-social behaviors of the in-group. To be pro-social means to be positive, helpful, cooperative, empathic, and or trusting toward other people. Now, it's clearly beneficial to act pro-socially toward your own children. Yet to act pro-socially towards strangers may or may not be beneficial, depending on whether they'll take advantage of you. Therefore, it makes sense for a hormone that promotes pro-social behavior to do so specifically toward people who aren't going to stab you in the back in the future. Oxytocin does precisely that. It makes us pro-social, but toward members of our in-group. An in-group is any group that you belong to, which is differentiated from other groups. Examples include a family, friend group, political party, religion, or nation. While we naturally favor our in-group at the expense of out-groups, oxytocin enhances this bias. In one study, researchers randomly assigned participants to teams, gave them oxytocin via nasal spray, and then asked them to rate how attractive they found various symbols. When they showed each symbol, they also showed the attractiveness ratings for that symbol from the participant's team as well as the other team. Individuals who received oxytocin were more likely to agree with their team's ratings and to disagree with the other team. 
So oxytocin appears to increase group conformity. As a quick aside on methodology, intranasal oxytocin is the preferred method of administration because oxytocin delivered orally or by injection tends not to get into the brain. Other studies have shown that oxytocin also seems to increase trust and other measures of prosociality, but mainly toward members of one's in-group. So how does it affect our perceptions of out-group members? Oxytocin can promote antisocial behaviors against outgroups. The flip side of in-group favoritism is out-group hostility, and oxytocin amplifies this as well. Think back to the mother-child bonding that oxytocin evolved to promote, and this outgroup antisociality makes sense. Oxytocin not only promotes parent-child bonding, but also the aggressive protection of offspring. Thus, as oxytocin's pro-social function expanded from the nuclear family to in-groups of all kinds, it didn't leave the aggressive protective function behind. A summary of a 2019 study by Heijing Zhang and colleagues stated, quote, the love hormone also helps individuals launch more coordinated attacks on outgroups. In a study involving multi-round economic contest games between groups of attackers and defenders, oxytocin did not make attackers less aggressive. Instead, it enabled them to better coordinate their attacks. Under the influence of oxytocin, the attackers timed their strikes to occur when rivals were vulnerable. Over time, the oxytocin users became better at coordinating their behavior with other members of their in-group. Now, findings like these are what led the neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky to write that, quote, oxytocin makes us more pro-social to us and worse to everyone else. Moreover, I would just add that in-groups and out-groups are flexible constructs. As psychologists have shown, just about any characteristic can become a marker of group status, even the arbitrary assignment of participants into teams by researchers. It's just that the group itself must hold some kind of significance to its members, however superficial. And it appears that oxytocin enhances our distaste for the outgroup. The social salience hypothesis of oxytocin. Still, other researchers have interpreted the two-faced nature of oxytocin in a different way. Instead of directly enhancing in-group bias, it simply enhances our sensitivity to social stimuli which may indirectly enhance in-group bias. This is the so-called social salience hypothesis of oxytocin. A 2016 article by Shamei Tsori and Abu Akal explains that, quote, oxytocin enhances pro-social behaviors only when the social context involves cooperative and positive emotions. Yet in competitive, aggressive contexts, oxytocin may enhance competitive or aggressive behaviors, end quote. Thus, oxytocin makes you more aware of the emotional tone of the social environment, and it is that heightened awareness that seems to change behavior. This hypothesis would also explain why oxytocin appears to sometimes decrease stress and anxiety, and other times increase it. Shamei Sori and Abu Akal write that oxytocin, quote, may increase the salience of safety signals in positive supportive contexts, which may attenuate stress. Conversely, in unpredictable threatening situations, oxytocin may trigger orienting responses to threat rather than safe signals and increase anxiety. In line with this hypothesis is the idea that regardless of in-group or out-group status, oxytocin appears to promote empathy. For example, intranasal oxytocin can make subjects better at reading emotional facial expressions. It may also increase our empathic reactions to other people's pain. In this context, we're talking about both emotional empathy, that's when you actually feel another person's emotional state, and cognitive empathy, where you simply understand what emotion they're experiencing. But how does oxytocin actually work in the brain? To answer that, let's first examine the basic neuroanatomy of the oxytocin system, and then see how oxytocin affects various brain regions involved in sociality the oxytocin system. Oxytocin is produced by neurons in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls physiological processes like body temperature, blood pressure, and hunger. Oxytocin is produced in two nuclei of the hypothalamus. These are the paraventricular nucleus and the supraoptic nucleus. Oxytocin acts both in the body, where it's important for reproductive functions, as we mentioned, and in the brain, where it's important for social behavior. 
To get into the body, some of the oxytocin producing neurons project to the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, which then releases oxytocin into the bloodstream. To get into the brain, oxytocin neurons project to various brain regions. Interestingly, oxytocin is not only released from axons of neurons, but also from cell bodies and dendrites of neurons. In this image, the dashed lines show dendritic or cell body release of oxytocin whereas the solid lines show the axonal projections. Okay, let's now turn to how oxytocin affects brain regions involved in empathy and social closeness. Let's look at a 2018 meta-analysis by Grace and colleagues synthesizing the results of 72 placebo-controlled intranasal oxytocin studies. First, the amygdala was consistently modulated by oxytocin when participants were either engaged in a task or simply resting. However, about half of those studies showed increased activity and the other showed decreased activity. In my amygdala video, I noted that the amygdala appears to detect when something is relevant for survival or other biologically relevant functions, including danger, other people, food, and sex. Yet, when it comes to salience, the brain actually engages a network of regions, including but not limited to the amygdala. According to Grace and colleagues, quote, Evidence that intranasal oxytocin increases salience and reward from social stimuli are supported by increases in brain activity following intranasal oxytocin, with a salience network comprising the amygdala, anterior cingulate cortex, and insula. Whilst also increasing salience to social information, these regions contribute to social decision-making processes." End quote. Accordingly, the authors observed increased activation during interpersonal tasks of the medial prefrontal cortex, which if you watched my PFC video, you know activates whenever we think about ourselves. Now, the single most consistently activated region was the superior temporal gyrus. And this one is particularly important because it is involved in processing of social stimuli, possibly by helping the brain to recognize emotional facial expressions in other people. Now, these authors believe that the STG drives the increase in cognitive empathy commonly seen with oxytocin administration. The authors also observed consistent functional changes to the default mode network. This is a set of brain regions, including the precuneus, posterior cingulate cortex, the medial PFC, and the inferior frontal gyrus, which is part of the lateral prefrontal cortex. This network is relevant because as the authors explain, quote, Increased default mode function has been associated with mentalization, empathy, and self-referential processing, and thus has an indispensable role in social understanding of others." End quote. Next, Grace and colleagues suggest that intranasal oxytocin increased activity in reward-based dopaminergic systems within the midbrain and basal ganglia that have a role in detecting socially relevant cues and providing subsequent reward. Finally, the authors found consistent activation in various areas of the temporal and occipital lobes, two massive regions that together make up a large portion of the entire brain and which are the primary areas of auditory and visual processing respectively. The authors interpret this as possibly indicating increased attention to the social situation. Now, before we wrap up, I want to emphasize the variability of these results. The actual effects of oxytocin on your brain would likely involve many of the regions we just talked about, especially the superior temporal gyrus. However, as we've noted repeatedly, these effects will be context dependent, that is, whether the social environment is safe or unsafe, and they will also depend on your sex. Indeed, this seems to account for much of the variability, but it's also context dependent and difficult to concisely analyze. Finally, these effects will depend somewhat on the particulars of your brain. So if you have autism, schizophrenia, or some other socially relevant disorder, then the activation pattern will be quite different. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of Sense of Mind. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and podcast, and also consider signing up for our free weekly e-newsletter by going to senseofmindshow.com newsletter. If you do, you'll be the first to get our newest videos and other updates from Sense of Mind. And don't forget to drop a comment below letting me know what you want to know about social cognition and social neuroscience in general. Anyway, as always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. 
Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.